What is up, Geeks of Doom? It is Danny, and I'm back with my MCU rewatch. We are rewatching the entire 23 films of the MCU, counting down until May 7th, when hopefully, pandemic under control, theaters reopen, Black Widow will be coming out. And isn't it perfect that I mentioned that? Because we are covering the film today that Black Widow made her MCU debut in. And I have some thoughts about that because as I was rewatching Iron Man 2 earlier with my son, I thought to myself, in many ways, this movie almost could have been a Black Widow movie. Uh, my son made the good point that all the other characters who get sequels, um, their movies have titles. Uh, so, Captain America, First Avenger, Winter Soldier, Civil War. Uh, Thor, The Dark World, Thor Ragnarok. Uh, <clears throat> Guardians of the Galaxy have Volume 2. It's not just called Part 2. You know, it's not just called Guardians 2. Um, but, you know, obviously the Avengers, it's not Avengers Parts 2, 3, and 4 at Age of Ultron. Uh, you know, Infinity War Endgame. So, uh... Iron Man is kind of the outlier there. It's just Iron Man 2 or Iron Man 3. And I thought to myself, and I, I said to my son, I almost think that this movie could have used a, a subtitle. Iron Man 2, Rise of the Black Widow. Uh, or, you know, if you don't want to... I, I, you know, I, I, I think they were a little nervous... Uh, as sad as this is to say, I think they were a little nervous back in 2010 to just green light a female-led superhero film. It sucks that I have to say that, but I think that is the case. It took a long time until Brie Larson in Captain Marvel uh, getting her own solo film, and we're just now, <laughs> 12 years later, you know, obviously... Uh, paused for a year because of the pandemic, getting Black Widow, Scarlett Johansson in her, you know, origin story film. Uh, that, so I don't, maybe they couldn't have made this a Black Widow movie, but I think maybe including Black Widow in the title, because as, as, as we get into this review, I think, I like Iron Man 2, but I think Iron Man 2 is also a mess of a movie. Uh, for, for a lot of reasons. I think that there, there's a lot of ideas going around. Uh, what we know about Black Widow is, you know, uh, from her Age of Ultron kind of flashback and then from the previews we've seen for her actual film, we know that she's, you know, this kind of trained Russian assassin uh, and... You know, I, I feel like the villain in this film, being a Russian villain, tying uh, Natasha Romanov to Ivan Vanko would have been a pretty cool little connection. Uh, and then maybe, you know, the movie is about Tony Stark, uh, you know, coming out to the world as Iron Man dealing with the palladium poisoning, which are stories that I actually really do like in this movie. There's a lot of stuff I like in this movie as well. Um, but at the end of the day, there are so many plot threads. Characters come on and then disappear for long periods of time in this movie. Let's get into it. Iron Man 2, first of all, just like with The Incredible Hulk, things you learn for the first time. Justin Thoreau, popular actor, uh, who I know from, I believe he's one of the main characters in The Leftovers. He was in, uh, he was in this movie that my, my wife and I watched and she really enjoyed it. It was a good movie. Uh, the Spy That Dumped Me, I think. And I think he was in that movie. My wife watched it, wanted to watch it because Sam Hewen is in it. Uh, and of course we cover, uh, Men in Kilts for this channel as well. So we'll talk more about Sam Hewen uh, in other videos. But yeah, this was written by Justin Thoreau. Uh, I didn't know he wrote, I thought he was just an actor, but apparently he also, he also wrote Zoolander 2. So mm -hmm. uh, John Favreau is back and as the director and is happy. 
and I think Favreau has made the point in the past, and I think that this is something that we've seen with Sam Raimi in Spider-Man 3, with Joss Whedon in Avengers Age of Ultron. As you get into sequel territory, uh, especially in a franchise or a growing franchise, which is what the MCU was back in Phase 1, the studios start to make demands, and your job as a director becomes less about making a great coherent movie and more about fitting in all of the ideas that the studio wants you to get in. And there's a lot of meddling going on. In fact, Jon Favreau would not direct another film in the MCU. He he was done as a director. I mean, he obviously shows up in other films as happy uh, and he's, you know, obviously responsible for creating in, in part as the director of the first Iron Man, uh, helping to, to jumpstart the MCU and the Mandalorian. So basically, John Favreau saved nerd and geek culture. So thank you, John Favreau. Um, but yeah, so the movie starts and there's like this cold open where we just meet this real nasty looking Mickey Rourke. This is Mickey Rourke two years after he was the front runner for best actor for The Wrestler. Uh, a lot of people thought he deserved that Academy Award uh, at the 2009 Oscars. He lost it to Sean Penn, who I believe uh, I believe it was Sean Penn that year for Milk. Har uh, he played Harvey Milk. I loved Sean Penn's performance in Milk. I'm a wrestling fan. I thought The Wrestler was great, but I would have given the award to Sean Penn. You could disagree with me. I'm sure most people do. It's okay. Uh, but... I actually showed my son a picture of Mickey Rourke in the 80s to compare, like, good-looking, uh, heartthrob Mickey Rourke to the Mickey Rourke that we know and love today. Uh, and he is watching the Tony Stark press conference from the end of the original Iron Man, and he's very angry. We see newspaper clippings uh, about his father uh, uh he his father's dying and basically he sets off uh in the pre-credits to create uh, an arc reactor so obviously his father has some connection to stark industries and to the arc reactor and now he is out for revenge on tony stark this is ivan vanko uh who would become whiplash later in the movie which we will get to uh we then jump to Tony landing at the Stark Expo in the Iron Man suit and welcoming everybody. It's been, you know, uh, unprecedented times of peace. And I really like that in this movie, that they address the fallout of the first Iron Man and, and the impact that Iron Man's had on the world. But then it also brings us to the other central part about Tony, which is the arc reactor that is keeping him alive is also killing him. Uh, he is using a corrosive element, palladium, and it is poisoning him. And he's got these like, like blood poisoning marks now growing out of his chest piece, growing up into his neck. Uh, and every time he uses the suit, it, it it's hurting him. And the fact that he lives with the arc reactor in his chest uh, is is just, it's actually killing him slowly. Uh, I really enjoy, and this is one of my favorite parts about the Iron Man 1, 2, 3 arc, is the, you know, Tony figuring out how to stay alive uh, from his initial wounds, but then the continuing uh, theme of having to come up with something to, you know, preserve the life that he has. And uh, his relationship with Pepper in this movie is made even better. She complains to him at the beginning about all the work he has that she's tasked with. So he says, yeah, okay, good. I'll pay you for it. You're now the CEO of my company. And he names her CEO of Stark Industries, which is pretty cool. Uh, we also, of course, get uh, Rhodey is back, except now it's Don Cheadle because Terrence Howard left after the first Iron Man. I guess there was a, an issue. Uh, we also get Justin Hammer in this film. 
Uh, Justin Hammer is a rival weapons designer, a, a, a weapons contractor to Stark. Uh, and he's with now that Stark has gone peaceful, he wants to be the number one weapons contractor to the U.S. government. We also have the shady Senator Stern, played by the late, great Gary Shandling, uh, who really, he wants to use the Iron Man suit as a military weapon. Tony, in a great scene in the Senate, won't give it to him because it's his property, and he is Iron Man. He wears the suit. He's like, you can't have the suit because that would mean you have me, and that would be indentured servitude. Uh, really cool scene. And Tony's losing basically his will to live at this point because he knows he's dying from the palladium poisoning. So he's just taking reckless chances. They go to Monaco and he jumps in a race car, does Tony Stark things. And this is where we meet uh, Whiplash. Ivan Vanko comes out onto the racetrack. Uh, his suit melts away in this really cool moment. And... He has figured out a way to pump arc reactor, like, electricity into these, like, wires that he whips. And he cuts down the race cars, gets Tony in a bad place before Happy and uh, Pepper make the save. And they, have a, they actually have a superhero versus supervillain fight 35 minutes into the movie. It's a pretty decent little scene. But Tony Stark, Iron Man, wins pretty decisively, knocks out uh, Vanko, and he goes to jail. And this is part of my issue with this movie, is you have a villain in... I thought, if you're going to make this an Iron Man movie, Justin Hammer, played by Sam Rockwell, who is in his like most over-the-top, sniveling... like wink at the camera uh, self here. He would have been my choice to be the main villain here. Uh, because you it, it, it makes sense. He's He hates Tony because Tony's just better at, at creating weapons that he, than, than he is. Um, but he's also a, a industrial rival. He's a rival with weapons contracting with the government. And I like the idea of him creating weapons and maybe using Tony's weapons against him later in the film. My The biggest issue I have with, first of all, Mickey Rourke. His accent is over the top, stereotypical. If I said to you, pretend you're Russian and do the most over the top, stereotypical Russian accent just short of John Malkovich in Rounders, you would get Ivan Vanko's, like, just super thick Eastern European sounding accent. You know, I want my bird. Give me my bird. I will get you Tony Stark. Like, it's, uh. He looks disinterested. He looks very disinterested in this movie. And I don't know why. I mean, he was having a career renaissance uh after the wrestler he had been nominated for an academy award uh you would think that he would you know to 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 be a part of this now third part of this mcu growing uh experiment but he just seems completely disinterested and like i said to my son if you take whiplash ivan vanko out of this movie it really doesn't change much because at the end of the movie, the big uh, climactic battle sequence is Tony's fighting War Machine, Rhodey, because Rhodey's suit gets overrided, uh, overrode by, by Vanko. And then he's fighting all the hammer robots, the, the, the hammer drones. You, all of that could have been Justin Hammer. He, you could have made him tech savvy enough to override uh, Rhodey's war machine suit to, in an attempt to kill Tony Stark. And you almost could have had it where Rhodey was the villain in in the fights uh, against Tony, 
and then Justin Hammer is like the kind of sniveling, you know, I, I love uh, Sam Rockwell calling uh, Tony Anthony. Oh, oh, hi, Anthony. How are you? And Leslie Bibb is back uh, from the first movie. Now she's kind of hanging out with Justin Hammer. I thought that was a nice touch also. Um, I really like that aspect of it. Vanko's character does nothing for me. And my one of my complaints that I said in my Hulk review was that uh, Emil Blonsky was kind of like he has no attachment to Bruce Banner. He's just this soldier who wants a challenge. So he goes after the biggest uh, fish out there, which is the Hulk. Uh, they try to make a backstory for Vanko, but they don't go into it enough. It's completely pre-credit. And then this movie, 20 minutes go by. From the time he's defeated in jail, uh, he, he gets... Uh, Justin Hammer ends up freeing him from jail and then using him to, you know, perfect his weapons so that he can go after Tony. Uh, and and there are just giant gaps of this movie where Mickey Rourke isn't in it. 20 minutes here, then he shows up for like one five-minute scene, and then he's gone again for a half hour to the point where you genuinely forget that he's in the movie until you see him again and you're like, oh yeah, he's in this movie. And that is one of the things to this movie's detriment. There are things that I like about this movie. All the scenes involving Tony and uh, Rhodey. All the scenes with Robert Downey Jr. and uh, Don Cheadle. All the scenes with Tony and Justin Hammer. Tony and Pepper. Uh, basically, Robert Downey Jr. has amazing chemistry with almost anybody he is on screen with in the entire MCU. And I think he actually shares the screen with Mickey Rourke for less than three, four minutes of screen time. Uh, he has one very quick scene in a, in a jail cell at the beginning, about 40 minutes into the movie. And then they, at, at the climactic battle sequence, uh, basically, after they've uh, Rhodey and... Uh, uh, War Machine and Iron Man defeat all the Hammer drones, it comes down, uh, Whiplash comes down in a new giant Iron Man type suit uh, with the whips made out of arc reactor. He basically looks like the Iron Monger from Iron Man, only with like a little addition, like Iron Monger Phase 2. So his, the design of the character as a supervillain, doesn't look that great. And then that whole climactic fight scene is over in like three minutes. It it really... I, I, Mickey Rourke, for me, is bottom tier MCU villain. Uh, one of the worst villains in the entire MCU. Um, and like I said, he's Russian. The character. Natasha Romanoff is Russian. If you're going to have these two characters who just happen to be Russian and you're going to be introducing Black Widow uh, in this film, this is her, her intro. She has her big uh, climactic scene in Hammer, in Hammer Industries where she has that hallway scene where she beats the hell out of a bunch of guards. Cool scene. Scarlett Johansson owns it, she does tons of cool stunt work, really kicks ass in this movie. But if you're going to establish her as a character who we're then going to see again a few movies later in The Avengers, and she's going to be one of the Avengers, it felt like we needed a better story for her than just, oh, she's a secret S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who just happens to be following Tony Stark around why not tie her to Vanko in some way? I, you know, like, I, I get maybe they're trying to follow the comics, and I think, you know, Ivan Vanko was, um, you know, Whiplash does have that backstory with Tony in the comics, but it just, I wish they would have incorporated the characters. Like I said, this movie is just messy. Then there's this whole separate scene where Tony 
um, is tasked by S.H.I.E.L.D. There's this great scene where he has this drunken brawl with Rhodey uh, in their re respective Iron Man suits. And he ends up in the, a donut, eating a donut in the Iron Man suit. And who shows up? Nick Fury. And you have this great scene in a, in a little like diner where it's Nick Fury played by Sam Jackson. Uh, Scarlett Johansson is there and Tony Stark. And they're talking about how... And they bring up Tony's father and how Nick Fury knew him. And, and they there's some really cool dialogue there. Uh, it's, it's a great scene. It just kind of feels like it comes out of nowhere in this movie. Uh, so much of it feels... Like, it's just, it just doesn't flow perfectly. I don't want to give all the blame uh, to Justin Theroux. I mean, Justin Theroux, he is a writer as well as an actor. So I, I'm sure, like I said at the beginning, I know that I've read and I've seen interviews where Jon Favreau said there was a lot of studio involvement. And it makes me feel like they they got Mickey, like, like I said, Mickey Rourke nominated for an Oscar for the 2008 movie, The Wrestler, he so 2009, he's going to the Oscars. He's the front runner to win an Oscar. So when they're casting this movie, they're probably thinking, we can get Oscar winner Mickey Rourke to play the villain in our next superhero movie. This is going to be great. And I just think it's one of those cases where they were stuck with an actor before they really knew uh, what they wanted from that role. And... It just didn't end up working. John Slattery makes his debut in the MCU here as Howard Stark. Uh, really love his scenes, his like old, uh, you know, recorded Super 8 footage uh, of him for the original Stark Expo. Really enjoyed those scenes. Uh, and that leads to the scene where uh, he left. I still don't really get the element part. I've watched this movie about a dozen times um, and I'm still confused by the... on the layout, on the, the, the physical map of Stark Expo from the 1970s, he left the formula for a secret element for his son to figure out 20, 30 years in the future, how, why he would know his son desperately needed to find this new element and how that element would, would be the one element to cure his palladium poisoning uh, and to charge the arc reactor um, into the next generation. I still don't get, I do like the scene where he's building uh, this, machine to create the element uh there's this fun scene with colson where colson picks up captain america's shield as like an easter egg colson starts to mark out a little bit because as we find out later he's a big captain america fan uh so yeah i <laughs> uh so tony cures himself and then of course like i said he goes on to the stark expo to fight uh <clears throat> Justin Hammer's Hammer Drones and Vanko. Um, a lot of stuff, like I mentioned with Iron Man, a lot of stuff pays off so much later. Great continuity with um, getting to meet John Slattery as Howard Stark uh, in Avengers Endgame when Tony has to go back uh, to the S.H.I.E.L.D. base to find... Uh, to find more uh, of the, the Pym Particles... Uh, and he and he actually gets to talk to his father. I thought that was a great moment. Uh, Justin Hammer, and we said this with the end of my Hulk review. At the end of the Hulk movie, you have so many um, unanswered questions because the Abomination is still alive. Uh, he's in cap. He's he's been you know arrested. I don't know how you arrest a an incredible Hulk style monster, but he's been. Uh, captured by shield most likely he's probably in that underwater prison uh then you have uh samuel stearns you know his head starts to grow he's probably becoming the leader but we've never seen him again 
In this movie, Justin Hammer uh, gets arrested at the end, and his final words in the movie to Pepper Potts are, I'll see you again real soon. Well, it's been over a dozen movies, it's been almost 20 movies since this one, and we haven't seen Justin Hammer back. And frankly, I would love to see Justin Hammer back. I think he's got the potential to be a cool villain uh, for the future. Uh, then you have uh, Senator Stern in this movie, Gary Shandling. We would see him again, I believe, in Winter Soldier. Uh, I, I know he's one of the senators who does the Hail Hydra. Uh, so I know he comes back. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, oh, and then they keep hinting throughout the movie. They keep hinting throughout the movie. Come on, Roku. That there's something that's been taking up their time, S.H.I.E.L.D.'s time, in the Southwest region. And then Coulson just leaves Tony and goes, up, oh, gotta go, I'm needed in New Mexico. And then, of course, we get our post credit sequence, which drew gasps from the crowd, uh, where Coulson pulls up and the camera pans back. There's this giant, like, uh, crater... And there is Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, just sitting there. That's the next movie that we'll be covering, Thor. My son is on a rampage. We've watched three MCU movies in three days. So tomorrow's Monday. I don't know if we'll get it in, but we're going to try to watch Thor tomorrow. So coming up either tomorrow or Tuesday will be uh, my video... Well, tomorrow, this video might go up on Monday. So probably Tuesday will be my video for Thor. And we're going to keep going all the way up until Black Widow on May 7th. What did you think of Iron Man 2? A lot of people think this is the worst of the MCU movies. I think it's good. I think this is a good movie with excellent parts, a great Robert Downey Jr., great chemistry with Samuel L. Jackson, with Gwyneth Paltrow, with Don Cheadle, with Scarlett Johansson, just kind of a, a with, with Sam Rockwell, just a lame duck villain in Mickey Rourke's whiplash, uh, and just too many stories taking place at the same time. Uh, so this is kind of a mixed bag for me. I would give this about a three out of a five. Um, it is it is probably going to be towards the end of my list. I don't know if it's my least favorite MCU movie, but it's probably towards the end of my list. So where it'll end up, I don't know yet because we're going to do the rankings all the way at the end. I'm starting to keep track, but we'll figure it out. Until Thor... We'll see you later, and we're halfway done now with Phase 1. Stay tuned to Geeks of Doom for more.